Hi, my name is Ken. I'm an alcoholic. I'm born and raised here in San Antonio, and uh, <laughs> I come from a different part of San Antonio. It's the northern part, and uh, <laughs> we say, "Hey, yo, forget about it," you know, like, "Hey, <laughs> you know, how far is it to the subway? We don't know. No one's ever made it. You know what I mean? You know, like." You know? <laughs> I grew up in the neighborhood. I used to say, hey, you fell asleep in the trunk of a car. You deserve to be shot. You know, like this is a, this is a, this was it, you know. But I, I noticed about one-third of the people were standing at a year or less. This is the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. You don't have to wait for the movie. The book is out, you know. You know? And, and the deal is, is that you're going to hear a lot of stuff from well-meaning people in your first year in sobriety and a few years thereafter. If it's not in this book, it is not Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, which is, uh, you know, yeah. you know, you actually have people who tell you no sex in the first year. <laughs> have you ever seen those people? <laughs> I mean, you keep the average alcoholic away from sex for a year. By the time he gets back, but he'll forget who gets tied up. You know, like, a, you know, <laughs> that's what I like my stuff here. Yeah, look at the stuff you had out here. You know, freedom from bondage and a little rope and stuff. You know, like, you know. I think this is symbolic of you got to bail out of your old ideas or something. You know, this is good. And then they they said you're going to have an escort service, and you know they. they in the AA meeting, I love it, you know. And then they had this thing here that they didn't read, which said you can request single or married men, ages 20 to 35, 40 to 65, and you guess at it, you know. Like uh, so, uh, so, so the deal is, is that you know, <laughs> this is alcoholic synonymous where almost anything can happen, and usually does, you know. Carol and I were fortunate enough to come here last year for the International. It was a great thing because you got, yeah. And, and I want to thank Grant for picking us up at the airport in Virginia for inviting us and all the folks involved. But when we were coming down, as Grant said, we were coming down from upstairs. The reason I was laughing was not only Carol was telling me a dirty story, but it was a... It was the fact that last year when we were coming down that same place, there were all kinds of crazy people there with hats and flags and bells and whistles and signs that said, Friends of Bill W. And it wasn't hard to figure out who belonged and who didn't because somebody goes, Who the hell Bill W.? You know? Like, <laughs> I guess they're not going to the convention, you know? <laughs> and the other people going crazy. And I, and somebody said to me, how would you explain an international convention? I said, I wouldn't even begin to. I said, it's the only place we can get 55,000 people to walk under a freeway. <laughs> you know, sober, you know, sober. And as you're walking through there, you're picking up helpful hints from people like, you know how to really decorate under the bridge living? You know, you know how you can, you know how you can make a nice corner warm in the wintertime? I mean, you're picking up tips that are going to help you in life, you know. From people who know, you know. <laughs> I mean, I, this is great. You know, I'm a real alcoholic. If you don't know what a real alcoholic is, it's you know, I, I scratch shit that don't itch. You know, like I, uh, you know, I, uh, I mean, that's what I do. You know, like <laughs> that looks peaceful. You know, uh, you know. You know? <laughs> I mean. I drank stuff that not only hit the spot, it removed it. You know, like it was like, hey, like whoa. You know, you know, I I, I grew up in I grew up in a, in a in a neighborhood and went to school. My dad died when I was young, and I was going to parochial school. I lasted four years in parochial school. Nothing against parochial school; it was good. I I just didn't know what was going on. 
And I was hanging out with Vinny and, and, and Tony. All the guys in New York are named that way. You know, everybody's name begins with A. A, a Vinny, a Tony, a Nicky, you know. <laughs> a Joey, you know. you know. So we're all A's, you know. And, but not in the classroom, not in the class. Got through school totally unscarred by education. You know, it, it never landed a blow. You know, I I was in the class with in the fourth grade with my buddy Nicky, and the teacher said, "How do you spell Mississippi?" And Nicky said, "You mean the river or the state?" You know, like, you know, you know, that that kind of a mindset. You know, and the only reason I really travel and do all this stuff really is to stay sober and to hear you guys laugh because I know a couple of things about laughter that most people don't know, and that is. You cannot laugh and think at the same time, you know? It's impossible. So every time you're laughing, you're getting a respite from you. <laughs> you know? And if you're sitting in one of these chairs, trust me, you need to break, you know? You know? You know? It is just the way it is. And then I read a report one time where it said, you know, the AMA says that laughing produces as many endorphins as sex. Now, endorphins are really good. They help you fight pain. They build up your immune system. I'm alcoholic. So I'm figuring if you can laugh during sex. You know? You know? Those babies are a-rolling, you know, uh, <laughs> like rolling, you know. <laughs> and, and the reality is you're getting healthy doing something that's really rather enjoyable, you know, you know. I mean, I, I, I love Alcoholics Anonymous because to me it's escape into reality, you know. The news is no longer reality to me, you know. I don't know if you guys ever watch the news, but if you turn it on, it's like a tsunami of bullshit. You know, it's like, it's like, it's like here it comes. Ooh, you know, it's stuff all over the world that people are doing to hurt each other. And then I come to AA where all people are talking about is how can I help you? How can I help you? What can I do for you? What do you need? You need a ride? You need, you need an escort? What do you need? Tell us what you need. You know, tell us anything. You know? No request goes unnoticed here, you know. Like, I mean, it's just great. But, I mean, it's a really, really fun kind of place to be. And this is where you want to be. And it's like you say to yourself, you get people get caught up in negative stuff, you know. You hear people say things like, well, I'm a loser. I've been a loser all my life. I never won at anything. I thought I won once, but I didn't. You know? uh, I'm a loser. So, you know, when I get with those guys, I say, hey, oh, you know, like, you know, when your dad ejaculated, he let go of 500,000 sperm to find one egg. You're the winner. You know? You're the winner. <laughs> <laughs> you went off at a 500,000 to one shot. You can't get that odds in Vegas. I mean, I, so what are you? I'm the winner now, baby. I'm the winner, you know. I mean, even a broken clock is right twice a day. I mean, you got to get out of that thinking, you know. An alcoholic in his mind, you know, as they say in our area, the Mexican guys will tell you, you know, your ego is not your amigo. You know, like, uh, you, know, you know, alcoholics, we got, we got the kind of a mind where when we're in a crowd, we say, you guys say, well, I'm in a crowd. I feel alone. <laughs> and when I'm alone, I feel like I'm in a crowd. <laughs> you know? <laughs> oh, pace yourself, Sparky. It's going to be a long day, you know. <laughs> You know, but I can relate to that because everything I, that I laugh at now, I did. You know, the first time I had a chance to vote was when Kennedy was running for the presidency back in '60, and and a guy was in an Irish bar drinking, very unusual, and uh, <laughs> and the guy said to me, "Who are you voting for, Ken?" And I said, 
Kennedy, and he said, I knew you would because he's Irish Catholic. And I said, no, asshole, I'm voting for him. Of course, I'm Irish Catholic. You know, like, you know, and, and, and that's the way I process stuff, you know. I don't know how you guys were when you were drinking, but bad ideas would just drop out of the sky. And they would fall right in the center of my head. And they would go right through my brain, totally impeded by logic and prior experience. And they would just come out my mouth. You know? It was kind of like a gumball machine, you know? You know? You know? And out it would come, and you'd say to yourself, where did that, people say, where did that come from? <laughs> Wouldn't you like to know, you know? Yeah. You know? I had crazy ideas. I mean, my mom used to walk through the living room, and my dad was dead, my mom was a little off her stride, and she would say things like, turn on the television, I don't want you sitting there thinking. You know? <laughs> you know? Because... <laughs> I used to get into really, really stuff, crazy stuff thinking. And, and when I was in high school, I was court ordered to a psychiatrist. I seemed to have some anger issues. And uh, I don't know where they came from. But, uh, and, and, and while I was in his office, he said, tell me what you're thinking right now. And I said, ah, I really don't want to get into it. He said, tell me what you're thinking right now. I said, please, I don't want to get into it. Finally, he said, tell me what you're thinking. So I said, okay. And really, I made something up. Because right when he asked me what I was thinking is, if my knees bent the other way, what would chairs look like? You know, and, and, and somehow I knew if I told this to him, it wouldn't go good, you know, you know, you know. But I, I had the ability to process anything incorrectly, you know, you know. I mean, and, and, and it seemed like I thought it was good ideas. I thought this was good, you know. I, I, if, 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 if they had a bridge to Hawaii, I'd be Ken from Hawaii. You know, I, I made a geographic in sobriety. You know, my, I, I got sober and, you know, I, I had a sponsor. And, and my sponsor is a guy you'd have to see. I mean, he was a very interesting guy. He had been a boxer and he never won. So when he talked to you, his head would be gone. <laughs> and, and if ever you questioned about anything, he'd say, if you want. But I have. And I wanted it. You know, so, so, so it shows you where I was coming from, you know. And, and, and I was separated from my wife then. She had moved out of state to save her sanity and took our kids with her. And, and I would go down and see them every other week, and then I'd, he'd invite me over for dinner because he'd say, you've got to come over for dinner, you know. And I always wondered about this, how they know stuff. When I went to my first AA meeting, it, I got sober July 5th of 1970, and I went to my first AA meeting, and I was wearing a blue wool suit <laughs> and a tie, July 5th, you know, <laughs> in New York, you know. And I had been in a barroom facial, you know, I got a barroom facial, I'd question somebody's ancestry or something, you know, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and, and I walked into the meeting and the guy said, newcomer, and I thought, how did they know this stuff, you know, like, oh. that was before I realized how intuitive you were, you know, I said, wow, this guy's good, he says, come up front, that's where the miracle is. Oh, yeah, I want the miracle. You know, I don't, I don't want to miss out on the miracle. So I went up front, and they put a little red name tag on me, Ken, so everybody knew I was Ken. And my sponsor used to invite me over his house for dinner because he didn't want me out there on my own. You know, I was, I was not to be trusted, that's for sure. So he used to have me come over. And he had, in 1970, most of you don't even remember this, but they had just come out with a nine-passenger station wagon. And the back seat faced out the back. <laughs> and Fast Eddie and I always had to sit in the back seat. And I said to him one night, why am I always sitting in the back seat? And he said, <laughs> I want you to see the wreckage of your past. You know? So, I was sitting in the back, you know? And so every time we went to a meeting, we piled in the car, me and Fast Eddie. Now, Fast Eddie was quicker than me almost. 
you know, he was about 45 years old, and he thought Moby Dick was a venereal disease. You know, like, he was like, he was like, he was completely out of it, you know. I'd say, Fast Eddie, what are you doing? Uh-huh. So between his, uh-huh, yeah, and I started to pick it up myself, you know. I was a... Uh, so one night I'm at my sponsor's house and the, and the telephone rings and he gets off the phone and I've never seen him this excited in my entire life. He is so happy. He said, we got a 12-step call. Ooh, 12-step. Ooh. So I was about two months sober. I said, good, good. I had no idea what it was. You know. So I go out to the car and I head for the back. He goes, whoa, sit up front. <laughs> hey. <laughs> hey, 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 hey. This thing's starting to pay off already, you know. I'm in the front seat. I can see what we're going to hit, you know. You know? You know? This is good. So he takes me over to this guy's house, and, of course, there's no parking. And he says to me, he says, Ken, can you go get this guy? And I said, yeah, I can go get him. I mean, you know, I'm I'm, I'm alcoholic, but I'm not mentally retarded, you know. I, I can I can ring the bell and get him. And he said, go do it. He said, we'll take him to a meeting. I said, good, good. He said, well, get him sober. Yeah, good, good, good. So as he tells the story, he rode around the block. And when he pulls back up, I got the guy on the ground. And I'm beating him with a garbage can lid. Sometime between that guy making the call... And us getting there, he had what was called a change of heart. You know? Which I have since come to find out he was entitled to, but I. But at this time, this was my first job in AA, you know? So I, you know, and I, I don't want to make it sound terrible, you know, that I. I I pulled him through the screen door when he had his change of heart, and I think, you know, he's going, you know, and, and, and I had him down, and I hit him maybe four or five, no more than six times, and, and, and after the third shot, he had a look like, I'm willing to turn my will in my life over to you, you know, you know, so when my sponsor pulled up, and he saw me there, and him on the ground, and the, not looking too good, he whistled me into the car like I was a canine. <laughs> so I get over and I get in the car and we start down the street. And now his head is all over the place, you know. <laughs> and he said, I want you to do me two favors. And by this time I'm into it. I'm like, yeah, sure, I can do two favors. He said, first, don't ever consider that a 12-step call. And then he says, second, don't tell anybody I'm your sponsor for a while. <laughs> he said, let's see how this thing goes, you know. But he got me this big book. And what he said to me was, basically, the answers I would need in life were in this book. And that if I could be still, which for an alcoholic of my type was a death-defying act, you know, I always felt like, let's go get it, you know. And, and the deal was, as he said, we're going to go through these steps. And we went through the steps just the way they were in the big book. And as I went through each step, I was evicted from my hiding places. I basically could see who I had been and what I had been doing. And, and it gave me a chance to grow spiritually. And today, as a result of that, I see things a lot different. I see things a lot different today than I did two weeks ago. And that's, to me, what the journey is. Some people think the journey here is a physical thing. Did you ever notice people who are going on a journey never leave? <laughs> I'm going on a journey. Yeah, you said that yesterday. You're still sitting here. You know what? The journey here is each day to see the world with a little bit more reality attached to it. That's the journey. To be able, you know, at one time there was the book written, A New Pair of Glasses. That's basically what it's about, except it's here. You just see things differently. 
And then you get to understand that when I was an active alcoholic, that what alcohol did for me was it took the real from reality. You know, I did drive-bys in reality, but I never lived there. You know, I would give away my rights. You know, did you ever get arrested? And the first thing they say to you is, you have the right to remain silent. I never had the ability. You know, I, I, I may have had the right, but I always felt there was something to be said, you know. And if we could just work it out, we could save our, both of us a long night, you know. But the reality of my life is that today I see things a lot differently. You know, I hear guys that say things like, Ken, if I keep turning my will and my life over to the care of God, I'm going to become like the hole in the donut. And then I get a chance to look them right in the eye and say, you are the hole in the donut. <laughs> you know? And thank God you are because donuts come and go. But the hole is always there. <laughs> and it's that hole that connects you to whatever the infinite is. The, you know, we are human beings, which means there's a human part of us and then there's a being part. A hundred percent of our problems are locked up in the human part, the form part of us, you know. I have guys that say things like, you know, I just can't believe in God. Why is that? Well, my mind tells me that if I can't see it, touch it, smell it, taste it, feel it, it doesn't exist. And you got this information from where? From my mind. Would, would you please show me your mind? You are rejecting a concept with a concept. You know, like a, you know. Well, you're asking me to set reality, reality aside so you can give me some theory. You know, like, I don't get it. I just don't get it. It's like when you say to somebody, you know, the old timers used to say, when I go to bed, at, or when I get up in the morning, I pray for God to keep me sober. And when I go to bed at night, I thank him for keeping me sober. And some newcomer will say, how do you know God did that? <laughs> He's the only one I asked. You know? Who else? Come on, you know. Anytime a guy says, well, I don't know if I need AA, I always ask him a trick question. And the trick question is, which is your strongest hand, your right hand or your left hand? How many are right-handed strong hand people in here? If you had open ketchup or something, you'd use your right hand. How many use your left hand? Good. Okay, now you're over 21, hopefully. Okay, put your hands like this. Push as hard as you can. Tell me which hand wins. <laughs> do we have any winners? No. If you do, we should have a place for it. But <laughs> it's another program. <laughs> but the reason you can't do anything is because the power to change is being met equally by the power not to change, and it's all coming from the same place. You need to get another power. We read it at every meeting where it says, we deal with alcohol, cunning, baffling, powerful. Without help, it is too much for us. But there is one who has all power. That one is God. May you find him Thursday. You know? <laughs> Nobody wants to find God in the now, and that's where God hangs out. And that's why when you hear people say, I feel disconnected. Of course you do. You're not living here. You know, you're here wanting to be there. If you go through your whole life here wanting to be there, you don't get the experience of here. You know, it's like you folks in the, in the first year. In the first year, you're going to think we're laughing at you. And you're going to be absolutely right. <laughs> But I want you to know we're not laughing at your problems. We're laughing at your solutions. You know? You know? You know? You're, you scratch shit that don't itch. That's just what you do. You know? Yeah, that's all you do. You know? You're, 
You're trying to solve a problem you don't have. So you can escape from a reality you're not in. This creates a lot of pressure. You're dealing in vacuums and myths and make-believe. You know, I sponsor guys that think that Alice in Wonderland is a documentary. You know, like, they, you know, it's like, it's just, and, and the reality here is, is that as you hear, you hear people say, I want to go to God, I want to go to God. All you need to know about God is you're coming from God. You were sent out from the home office, okay. Somewhere along the line, you didn't see yourself as being okay, so you started making up other personalities. You know, Bill in his story says it very best. He says, I'm going to prove to the world that I'm important. We don't want to be who we are. We want to be something else. You know, if you wake up in the morning and you're a daffodil, and you want to be a rose, it's a long day. You know, it's a long day. It's a long day. You are never going to be a daffodil. You know, because you I mean, you're never going to be a rose because you are a daffodil. You know, and, and the quicker you get to that thing, the better off you're going to be. And, you're, and you read stuff in the book, in the literature, and in the beginning you find it, at least I found some of it, very offensive. I didn't know why you couldn't have resentment. You know, I really didn't know. I thought there are some people who deserve your anger. They treated you badly. They, you know, you can't believe some of the stuff. And the deal is, is I'm entitled to that. Not realizing that by being angry with them, I was hurting me. You know, people read all kinds of, of prayers in the morning. And if they work for you, that's terrific. The only thing I read is on page 90 in the 12 and 12 where it says, every time I am disturbed, every time, not occasionally, not once in a while, not most of the time, every time I am disturbed, no matter what the cause, there's something wrong with me. And what that does is it puts me in a position to eliminate other people from distracting me from the one who has all power because what you think about most is your higher power. And if you're thinking about this other Yahoo who you don't want to have anything to do with, I really, really hate this person. So I'm going to spend the whole day with him, you know. I'm going to talk to him in my mind. We're going to work it out to my satisfaction. And then I sit in the lazy boy and wonder why I'm overcome, you know. Like a... The minute you start worrying about what someone else should do and shouldn't do, you are moving away from the only chance you have to do anything about it. And that is to ask God to come into your life and to be of some service to you. It talks about, and, and, and Dick mentioned it last night, there is one who has all power. So if that person, entity, whatever you want to call it, has all the power, what's left? Come on, even you guys that were in the Blue Jay group should get this one. You know, like, you know. I hang out with guys who, you know, they're out there where the buses don't run. And, and they know the answer to that question, you know. Uh, he has everything else. I, I don't know how to say this, Ken, so not be offensive, but that doesn't leave me nothing. Sharpo. I didn't realize I was working with a college grad, you know. But the deal is, is that that's the deal. You, you have transferred the whole thing away from what other people are doing to you, and now you're addressing it from the standpoint of what you could do for it. And it's the language of the heart. If you want information, count on your brain. That's what it does, give you information. But if you want transformation, you're going to have to go through your heart. And that's why Bill continually refers to the language of the heart. You're going to have to go through your heart because your brain has too much screening. You can't get anything through there, you know. It's already made up its mind, you know. The song here, you know, let it begin with me. When I saw it, I said, you know, the song for AA should be, I am always on my mind. I am always on my mind. 
That's who we are, you know. Yeah. The world's coming to an end. What's going to happen to me? <laughs> Don't worry about the rest of them. Cut right to the chase. You know. <laughs> Where am I going to live? You know. <laughs> Who's going to lead? You know. <laughs> but the deal is, is that the mind is telling you all this nonsense all the time, and it's not true. You actually have the right to ask your mind where that idea is coming from. You know, if you get up in the morning, like I hear people say, when I get up in the morning, my mind is waiting for me at the end of the bed and it tells me what to do and it starts setting the tempo for the day and it takes over my life and my mind is... If your mind is playing that role in your life, then it's not your mind. You're its body. You know, like it... it, it, I mean, you wouldn't take that shit from your hand, would you? Like, <laughs> you know, like, hey. <laughs> I'm going for a drink. Hey, wait for me, you know. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but the whole deal here is that when you start to realize that hey, what I say, what I'm going to say next is, it, I mean, I don't mean to ruin the newcomer's life or the old timers, actually. But when you come down to it, what each of our lives is, is a mental story we tell ourselves. We're the producer. We're the director. We're in charge of the costumes, the script, the staging. We're responsible for everything. You would think we'd tell ourselves a good story. <laughs> you would just, not how bad it is, you know. I oh, you don't, can't believe how bad it is, you know. 500,000 to one. <laughs> you came out of the shooter winner. Are you kidding me? So the deal is, is that, but... People get caught up in all this nonsense. And that's why I love coming to meetings and hearing people laugh and hearing people talk about things they work their way through. And, you know, every AA meeting, I don't care where you go to meetings, but every AA meeting has a hall of fame. People that people in the group go, oh, yeah, that's something. He, he did this or he did that. And it's like something they encountered in life and how they worked through it and, and how much that person meant to them. And it doesn't matter whether they're really a an extremely bright person or not, or uh, whether they've accumulated a lot of wealth. You know, till the day he died, Bill Wilson referred to Emmy Thatcher, Ebby Thatcher, excuse me, as his sponsor. And Ebby did not stay sober consistently. And Ebby caused Bill a lot of heartache at times. But when they had the International in Seal Beach in, in 1960, Bill wrote in the book that he gave to Ebby at that convention, I think of you every day because on a bleak November afternoon in 1934, you carried the message of salvation to me and you carried it with the language of the heart. And without you, I wouldn't be here. You know, when I look back at the number of people who tried to help me and I, and I didn't even know they were trying to help me. I mean, I, you just kind of blow through a lot of folks, you know, but they were just trying to help me. And when I got to AA, my sponsor was so good about a lot of stuff because he used to say, well, you know, you could always go back to being happy, joyous and alone, you know, <laughs> you know, and, and my sponsor was great because he didn't put up with a lot of nonsense. He had a very short you know, attention span. I'd call him at night when my wife and kids were gone, and I'd say, I can't see my wife. He'd say, good for her. She needs to break. You know? <laughs> and, I'd, and my kids, I don't know. You know, I miss them. Every day I miss them. My heart just is so empty without my kids. And yeah, well, they're, they're going to get good things, too. You know, they're, they're doing good. And then after about two minutes, Max, he'd say, hey, Ken. Maybe you'll get lucky and die tonight. And he'd hang up. You know? And suddenly the whole playing field would switch. And I'm like, whoa, you know. Whoa. Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa, you know. Hey. And, and the deal is, is that, you know, you, 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 you get that message real clear from the old timers. It's like, if you want to talk about real stuff, I'll help you. But if you want to come in and be like a constant drama queen, you know, like, and then you know what he did. I don't care. 
I'm more interested in what you're going to do. You know, you know, it's a program of action. It's not about what's going on in your mind. You know, like I'm going to do this tomorrow. I'm going to do it next week. You know, when 9-11 happened and I had gone back to New York before that and, and, and right after that. And, and the deal was, is that uh, as soon as 9-11 happened, I used to do seminars in the World Trade Center. I used to do seminars in the World Trade Center. And and they and each of those buildings had its own zip code. And had those planes come in later in the day, the, the, the toll would have been entirely different, much, much higher. And the reality is, is that New Yorkers, are, well, all you got to do is read the paper recently about New Yorkers. I'm not going to go there. Uh, <laughs> if I got started on that, I'd be here for a week, you know. But any, anyway, I... I the deal was New Yorkers, two days, after the, two days after the World Trade Center, there were T-shirts that everybody was wearing to work, and they were wearing them over their suits. And it showed the World Trade Centers, and it said, New Yorkers are hard to herd, but they're damn near impossible to stampede. You know, like, and, and the deal was is that everybody was like just together. It was the most together part of the city. You know, the muggings went down, the stick-ups went down. You know, people say, ah, give them a pass. <laughs> Enough stuff going on already. You know what I mean? So the deal was is that the whole city was at it was in a was in a place that was very different. And and when the world started to get really crazy, and I was sharing with Dick at supper tonight that uh, I took off. You know, I I gave away everything I owned, and I went out and I lived on an Indian reservation in New Mexico. And people in my family. <laughs> They were calling saying, we think you've lost your mind. <laughs> and I said, not yet. <laughs> but I'm really working on it, you know. <laughs> and I got over there with these Navajo Indians and, and lived out there on the reservation and got to do things that most people don't get to do. And that is, I'd lay on the side of a mountain, the San Juan Mountains there, and watch the eagles just fly. And when you watch an eagle fly, you get the idea that everything is okay. I mean, like, there's something okay because it's just so beautiful and, and graceful to watch. And I went up there with this medicine, one, medicine man one time, and we're sitting on the side of the San Juan Mountain and watching. And up there, there's a Navajo Dam, water dam, and they have some of the best trout fishing in the world there. I don't know whether it has to do with the dam or not, but I'm not a fisherman. And these guys do this fly fishing, you know. And they make these little tiny flies because they do this thing called catch and release. You know, yeah. I'm from New York. We do catch and fillet. So, <laughs> so, so the deal is, is that they do this catch and release. So we stopped watching the eagles and we watched this guy play with this trout in the water. And, and he was playing with it for a while and bringing it in and bringing it in and bringing it in. And finally he got it in and he took that fly gently out of its mouth. And he put it back in the water and shook it a little bit and let it swim off. And we were so engrossed with that fish, we never saw this eagle coming down. And that eagle came down and dropped its talons in the water and snagged that fish and flew off. And this Indian never moved his head. He just kept looking straight ahead. And he said... Did you ever have a day like that? <laughs> you know? Where you think you're leaving the scene of an accident only to find out you are the accident, you know? <laughs> like, I got away with that? <laughs> oh, no, you know? <laughs> and, and the deal was is that that's the way life is. Every one of us never know when the talons are going to hit the water and snag us. And that's why if you're not living in this moment, you're wasting a lot of time. You know, if you're anticipating what's going to happen in the future. You know, I, I see things differently than a lot of people at times. Like in our neighborhood, now I live in San Diego, and it's a whole different climate of people. You know, and, and, and when the, before the recession came, Everything was about money, 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 money. Women were dating guys for their money. Guys were dating women for their money. But you know what? Now that the recession's here, personality is making a comeback. You know? You know, 
personality is starting to you hear people say things like, you know, she's nice, you know. Not where she works or what she can do, you know. She's nice. And so you just realize. And, and then I come to realize that at, at our base root, alcoholics are very romantic. We are very romantic, you know. We have this romance in our blood, you know. Right from the first casual look. <laughs> all the way through to the restraining order. You know, like, we... we We, we have this kind of like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and when you come to Alcoholics Anonymous, one of the things you get to see if you stay here long enough and keep your eyes open and learn to stand still in the moment you're in instead of trying to anticipate the next moment, you'll find that there are things bigger in life than you ever imagined. When we were here last year for the International they, they marched in about, I think it was 50, 51, 52 flags. And, and in order to have a flag marched in at the International, you have to have someone registered from that country, which I didn't know that. I found that out. And I was with a guy who is very active in getting AA started in Iran. And right now, there are roughly four or 500,000 alcoholics in recovery in Iran. You know, this is a country where they kill you if you're a drinker. So to get people to go to meetings. <laughs> but, the, but the deal is, is they marched in the flags and they marched in the flag from Israel. And then the next flag, because Iran's technical name is the Islamic Republic of Iran. So the, uh, the Iranian flag was marched in right after the Israeli flag. And when it was over, when the, when the meetings were over, those of you who were at, who were at the Alamo, Alamo Dome, the, the, the crowd just started to move en masse to get out. And this guy said to me, I'd like to take a picture with the flag and send it back to the guys back home. And I said, sure. So we made our way through this, you know, going the wrong direction. <laughs> Thank God it was only like 50, 55,000 people. So... Yeah. <laughs> It wasn't too bad. You know? <laughs> and we got up there, and as I started to take the picture, there were people there, and they were wrapping themselves in the Israeli flag, and he was in the Ar Iranian flag, and they were hugging and kissing and sharing the flags. And you realize at some depth, this is the way it's supposed to be. This is exactly the way it's supposed to be. People taking care of people. Our whole purpose for being here is to take good care of one another because we're only on loan. And not to get caught up in all the other crap. I call it milking a mouse, you know. You, you know. A lot of activity, but very little milk, you know. You know. You know, you, you, but you don't understand. <laughs> Weepers and whiners, you know. <laughs> Can I lost my job, you know. And then how it's all perception. How the whole deal of life is perception. I had a guy who came to visit me and we had coffee in the morning and he said to me, Ken, if my wife leaves, I don't think... I can stay sober. I love her so much. And he meant that. And then in the afternoon, I had a guy come and have coffee, and he said, if that bitch stays, I'm done. You know, there's just no way. I'm done, you know. So it's, it's not the event. It's how you interpret the event, you know. You know. It's all about perception, and that's the way we take stuff in. And that's why it's real critical to live in this moment. And, you know, we have so many good lines in the book that say that. And, and that one about there is one who has all power. That one is God. May you find him now. You'll find out that things will happen in your life that you can't explain. 
I decided when my wife and I decided to get back together after two years of being separated, and we were walking around on eggshells, as you do when you haven't lived with someone for two years, and I started doing stupid things in sobriety. By stupid things, I mean I, would, I was going through red lights to get home because I didn't want her to think, well, he stopped for something. You know, he's, he's, he's doing the same old nonsense. And so I'd go through a red light or I'd do something really dopey because I didn't want to upset her. And the bottom line was... And then my kids were going to school, and some of the things I did at the end of my drinking made the newspaper. So my kids, just when everything got settled down, would come home and say, Dad, my teacher remembers when you did this and you did that. So we decided we'd make a geographic in sobriety. So we moved from New York to California. It was as, as far as I could go in a car, you know. <laughs> Had there been a bridge to Hawaii, I'd be Ken from Honolulu, you know, like uh, But we got in the car, we had nothing, and we moved cross-country. And before we left, my sponsor said to me, he had us over his house for a dinner, and he said to me, I never asked you to make a promise to me, but I'm going to ask you to make a promise now. I said, what's that? He said, when you get to California, I know you don't know where you're going to work or where you're going to live, but whenever you get there, please go to some church for six months because you're going to need the connection and the extra juice. I said, okay, I promise. So when I got to this little town, La Mesa, because we're going to start in San Diego and go up the coast, when I got there, and he, I said to him, I hope I know where to live. And he says, don't worry. You'll know. So I got to La Mesa. I was raised Catholic, so I went to the uh, Catholic church there in La Mesa. And, and this Irish priest said the Mass. And then after the Mass, we went to get donuts in the rectory, and we're having coffee. And this Irish priest came over, and he said, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Bill Wilson. <laughs> I said, excuse me? <laughs> he said, my name is Todd Abiel Wilson. Okay. Okay. He said, are you going to be living here in the parish? I said, uh, could be. Yeah. He said, are you looking to rent or buy? I said, well, there's no chance of us buying anything. We're, we're just not in position to buy anything. I said, we'll be renting. He said, why don't you come over to the rectory? There's a guy in the parish, and I'll give you his card, and he can help you. So I said, okay. So we walked to the rectory. He opened the little box. He pulled out a card, and he handed it to me. And it was Bob Smith, Realty. <laughs> now, I'm not the brightest bulb in the room, you know. <laughs> but the first two names I met at this church were Bill Wilson and Bob Smith. That was 1974, and that Bill Wilson was not sober. And that Father Bill Wilson came into AA two years later. But he, he wasn't sober at that time. But he knew in a short period of time when I joined the parish that I was sober. And he used to call me because he drank black and white scotch. And I don't know if most of you remember that, but they used to have the Scotty Dogs the black and white Scotty dogs. And he'd call me in, in this great Irish accent. He'd say, oh, Kenneth, I took the puppies for a walk last night. <laughs> and he said, oh, I'm going to need a lot of help today, you know. <laughs> yeah. And when he came into AA a couple of years after I had met him, he got to speak all over. Can you imagine an, an Irish priest with a great brogue whose name is Bill Wilson trying to make it an AA? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and we got to be good friends. And I stayed there. And the reality is, is that I never really connected with that church after that. And when my son was dying, he said, I'll be happy to come visit. And he came and he visited. And he said, you don't belong to the parish and you haven't been active. But if you want a parish ceremony, I'll give it to you. And my son died at 29 years of age. And he died in hospice. And he had been really sick at home. 
And I got to see the reality of sickness in a whole different way. Because you just don't expect a kid 29 years old to be sick. And he had AIDS. And he got to the point where he went from 190 pounds to about 110 pounds. And he wanted to maintain his dignity. So he wanted to go to the bathroom rather than do anything else. And so I would throw comforters and pillows on the floor and watch my son crawl across the floor. And one day as he was doing that, it came to me. And God has a great sense of humor because my ex-wife started swinging by. And I got to meet my husband-in-law. And... uh, (laughs) And one day when my son was crawling across this comforter and these pillows, it came to me like a vision that here's my son crawling on the floor to maintain his dignity. And I had crawled on the floor and lost my dignity. So it's not about the event. It's about so much more. And that's why if you're sitting in one of these chairs tonight, you've been given an unbelievable gift. I hope, particularly for you newcomers, that you give this this thing a chance, as was suggested by all the other speakers, and that you don't you don't try to beat yourself up too badly. This is really God's daycare. <laughs> with his kids with special needs. But I want to offer encouragement because it's like no fool left behind. You know, like uh, we don't care who you are, where you came from. This is home. Welcome. We're glad you're here. And just remember that through your mind, you get the information. But through your heart, you get the transformation. And if you want to live happy, joyous, and free then you have to reach a point where you unconditionally accept who you are, where you are,